Miss Zone. I don't know what that means, but that's what they're calling this in uh, Seattle. These restaurants are open. There's couches in the middle of the road. There's gardening uh, taking place. You know, we should note the context to this. The president saying that uh, that it, it may come down to him to step in and bring in troops to take back over this zone. We should note it was the mayor and the police chief who pulled back police. There had been more than a week of protests uh, that had escalated in violence with uh, flashbang grenades and pepper spray and tear gas being used. And that's when the city decided on Monday to pull back. And that's essentially when this autonomous zone uh, was created. I want to let you hear directly from Mayor Jenny Durkin of Seattle uh, responding to the president's suggestion that he may use his own force here in the city. The right to challenge authority and government is fundamental to who we are as Americans. We do not need anyone, including the president, to try to sow further divide, further distrust, and misinformation. The threat to invade Seattle, to divide and incite violence in our city, is not only unwelcome, it would be illegal. There was one resident that I talked to that said the last several nights, he's actually felt safe, unlike the week prior when the police force and those protests were ongoing. We should also note, though, that the police chief yesterday said the call time response has increased by three times because that precinct, that east precinct uh, for the police department remains vacant at this time. Peter? Vaughn Hilliard in what they call Cary Park with a gorgeous view of the Seattle skyline on this Friday morning, Vaughn. <laughs> thank you very much. The city council in Louisville, Kentucky just voted unanimously to put an end to the kind of police warrants that resulted in the death of Breonna Taylor. Her death had become a rallying cry of protests across this country. I want to weigh in on what they're fixing to talk about as far as no-knock warrants. This is the very thing that they supposedly had during the Waco siege, the only problem was with the Waco siege is that their plans had been spoilt and the Davidians on the Waco compound was actually laying wait for them to come in on top of them. These no-knock warrants are very obvious, very, very dangerous whenever you come in on a group of people or an individual that you don't know for sure what the end consequences of the circumstances are going to be. Especially if you're dealing with something this sensitive because they could have apprehended David Koresh down in Waco, Texas at a numerous amount of times while either going to the hardware store or going to the grocery store but they chose to want to stick their chest out and do things in a big showboating type way that literally costed the lives of what happened down at Waco towards it being one of the biggest catastrophes that led into the Oklahoma bombing because of these unethical, unprofessional practices that these law enforcement agencies use. Please listen to this particular situation up in Kentucky <clears throat> in which, as far as I'm concerned, every one of them in Land Between the Lakes that was associated in my case should be apprehended and arrested, including Gary Hawkins and Miss Hawkins and Dwayne Camry of the way that they handled that situation towards trying to entrap me like I was some sort of a homegrown terrorist, like I was going to do some sort of damage or do some sort of harm to the Kentucky Dam. It either come from the LBL administration's department or it come from Calvert City over in that area or Grand Rivers of a group of people that was trying to shut me down at using all expense even at the point of trying to mark me as me being a homegrown terrorist. The same thing that occurred right here in Weekly County in Martin, Tennessee in 2005 simply whenever I was talking to a, a uh, convenience store teller, a gentleman, and explaining to him the controversy that was going on in my life at the time. So please listen to this story.
calls to ban no-knock warrants nationwide. Here's how her family reacted to the news of what's now Brianna's Law. NBC's Cal Perry is in Louisville, where protesters have been demanding that change in policy. Cal, does Brianna's family and do those protesters feel like they're finally getting some form of justice here? I think they do. I think this is the first step amongst many. You can actually see Brianna's mother behind me. There's been a number of ceremonies uh, today following the passage of that law. You know, I think one of the things that's important here is what happens to those police officers who are still under investigation. Three of them, it was, again, three months tomorrow when Brianna was killed in what they call that no-knock raid. We've been speaking to people here amongst the city council about what this law means for them to be able to pass it. Take a listen to one of the members, what they had to say earlier this morning. When I think about the world that I want my children to live in, I want it to be a, a safer world. I want it to be a more compassionate world. I want it to be a place where black people are not being killed by law enforcement in their own homes. There's no reason for it. When you talk again to Brianna's family, um, They'll tell you that this is now a question of how to involve civilians in the policing here in Louisville, how to have some kind of oversight, some kind of inspector general. We are also going to pivot at some point tomorrow to the funeral of David McAtee. He was shot a week ago on Sunday. I think there's a lot of discussion about what happened in that case. It's bringing up all of these issues, of course, nationwide, Peter, but the one here that seemed to be central, again, were those no-knock raids, which will now be uh, not allowed here. Cal Perry on the ground for us in Louisville. Cal, thank you very much. And Kentucky's Republican Senator Rand Paul, who leans libertarian, wants Brianna's law to go further than just in Louisville. He's calling for a nationwide policy change. Yesterday, Senator Paul introduced the Justice for Brianna Taylor Act that would ban federal law enforcement officers from carrying out no-knock warrants. I want to bring in NBC News legal analyst Maya Wiley, university professor at the New School. I want to weigh in again on my particular subject up in Kentucky. Um, I think it was Marshall County, the capital there in Murray, Kentucky, that wound up coming to Aurora, Kentucky in a campsite. Two officers, two Kentucky State Troopers, two TVA officers, Tennessee Valley Authority pertaining to the river, and one FBI uh, FBI guy that was seven cars that, that that launched into a campsite there in outside Aurora, Kentucky, in behind the uh, in behind the pavilion, the state pavilion building there. <clears throat> that was trying to desperately get me for explosions, get me for trying to do harm or damage to the Kentucky Dam. And whenever you get to looking at what has gone on pertaining to these no-knock warrants, these are basically all occurrences that are involving firearms. My particular case exceeds firearms it goes up into the category of explosions, ATF, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms that is usually associated with these type of involvements along with U.S. Marshals, along with the FBI. So whenever I talk about my particular case up in Land Between the Lakes and Calvert City and Grand Rivers and Murray, Kentucky, Aurora, Kentucky, Benton, Kentucky, whenever I talk about my case out in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, or the involvement of what has went on in my life here in the state of Tennessee, up in Knoxville, Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee, as well as Weekly County, Tennessee, Whenever I talk about these occurrences that has happened in my life, going all the way to the GBI agency, Georgia Bureau investigations out in Atlanta, Georgia, and how that they basically shook me down 
and stop me from being able to engage or enjoy a firework 4th of July uh, display. I'm just not talking about guns. If I was talking about firearms or guns, I could put myself in the same category as some of these situations where some of these people have been in these alterations. Even though I personally have never been shot at by a cop, even though I've never been shot by a cop, it's only because I knew to freeze and to take commands in whatever that they ordered for me to do during the time that the occurrences was happening. But you're losing perspective of the seriousness if you're thinking, well, this is just another gun charge, or this is just another individual of surrounding some sort of gun activity. No, no, no. My activity since 2005, since a bunch of heathens up here in Martin, Tennessee, including Tommy Moore, including Benjamin Dempsey, that wanted to mark me as me being some sort of a homegrown terrorist, went from one league to another league to the point of them trying to mark me as me being a threat to not only the state, but a threat to my own people here in the United States of America, pertaining to not firearms, but explosions. And I have never, that I know of, been in contact with any type of explosions other than whenever I was about 12 or 13 years old, I remember going through somebody's house uh, that was abandoned. It was an older house, a spooky old house, probably had nobody lived in it for 15, 20 years. And somehow or another, I come up on a box of detonators. I don't even know now what I've done with the detonators. I think I brought them home and Dad activated them or done something with the, with the detonators. But as far as me actually being in, in uh, access to any type of, of uh, dynamite or any type of C2 or any type of explosions uh, on any different category, I've never been involved in any type of explosions, even while I was out in uh, New Mexico, Los Alamos, New Mexico. Um, doing research on the individual that used to work for the lab there in Los Alamos that created the black hole. As far as I know, I have never been engaged either directly or indirectly with any type of explosions other than what went on in my life in 2009 out in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, whenever a Captain Patrick Burns, which is now the administration for West City, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, working under the mayor's office, uh, planted a device, an explosion device, some sort of a bomb in the back end of my truck that whenever they activated the bomb, it actually blowed the windows out of my uh, out of my camper, out of my topper. It blowed the windows out of it and basically destroyed a topper. That's the only time that I have been in the presence of explosions, either directly or indirectly, and those was explosions that was planted on my life, planted on my automobile, planted on my property. So whenever I engage in the conversations that I engage in, it goes well, well beyond firearms. Or it goes well, well beyond somebody that was trying to be framed or set up by various institutions all over this country towards somebody having a gun. No, 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 no. My case has always exceeded that going all the way into the nine tapes that wound up going to the White House engaging with Homeland Security in 1988, 1989, 1990 or 91 up in Willing, West Virginia. Um, 
and then the association with what went on in my life in 2007 or 2008 up in Kentucky, then in 2010 up with the federal Kentucky authorities pertaining to me going to MCC in downtown Chicago and then what went on in 2013 with the same bunch of people up in Land Between the Lakes pertaining to the state of Kentucky. All these engagements was engagements towards trying to mark me as somebody that was a terrorist that exceeds anybody that's got a damn pistol or has a gun or somebody that was related around gun charges. So I just wanted to clarify that in this particular interview or tape that I'm doing right here on TV in regards towards people having a no-knock warrant and being able to go in on somebody and cause the havoc like they caused in Waco, Texas. The former assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York civil rights decision, she's obviously... On both sides of the border, but the natural question, of course, will be... What right now they're finally happening take for example the university of alabama that is presently uh, removing three confederate plaques placing them as they describe it in a more appropriate historical setting are you struck by how fast this is happening right now in the wake of george floyd's death just a couple of weeks ago and what is the appropriate setting for these statues these commemorations so that history is not forgotten and certainly is not repeated so the first thing we have to do is admit what these statues and what these plaques actually are, right? They're, they're monuments to a particular ideology. Many of the statues were erected in the 1890s up to the 1920s, and they were really this effort to kind of uh, memorialize uh, the lost cause, right? This idea of white supremacy that was taking root in the country. We also see another proliferation of building of buildings of these or the erection of these statues in the 1950s as segregation is being challenged. So we need to understand what they are. They're not really historical artifacts in some ways, only to the extent to which we view them as artifacts of uh, a racial ideology. So they need to be moved into museums. They need to be uh, kind of contextualized in that way. But I want to I want to resist uh, something that you just said, Peter. Just for a little bit pushback. That is, this is not quick. We've had we've been having this debate for a while. Bree Newsom climbed the pole, yeah. right, in in, in 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 Charleston to take down the flag. We've had the debates around the Confederate flags in Mississippi and the like. This is a slow churn that has now bubbled up to the surface. The nation stands at a crossroads. We have to decide who we are, what will be our symbols, as we aspire in some ways to finally break free from a history that threatens to choke us. Yeah, that's an important point that you make there. Of course, Eddie, people may not be aware that you're from Mississippi right now. A lot of folks are watching a bipartisan group of lawmakers there who are pushing to remove the Confederate emblem from the state's flag. There was a similar conversation and some similar um, tough conversations, frankly, that took place in the wake of the awful massacre at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston in 2015. Is this the time that that state's flag will finally remove the Confederate emblem? Oh, from your from your lips to God's ears, I hope so. Uh, it seems to me that we need to uh, recognize that the Confederate flag represents uh, treason. It represents traitors. It represents uh, folks who were willing to die on behalf of slavery. It's not just simply states' rights. I think that way of life uh, uh, was was cruel. It was evil, uh, and we need to understand what values it represents. And this is the this is the beauty and power of history. It's always ongoing. It's always written uh, over and over again because the human drama is always kind of enacted. And so we have to tell a story about who we are in relation to who we aspire to be. So the New South, we've been claiming it for a while. We're always proclaiming the New South. Well, that's going to have to begin with the symbols that represent who we are, uh, and and hopefully we will finally put aside. Uh, the stars and bars or whatever the hell it's called and, and begin to imagine ourselves differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a critical chapter being written even as we speak. Eddie Glau, we always appreciate your expertise and your perspective. Thanks for spending time. Appreciate it. Up next, an exclusive report from NBC News why the nation...
I want to weigh in on that particular conversation. When my brother died, David Jeffrey Jackson, I was inspired knowing our background of where my people come from, going all the way back to the Civil War era. I knew that I had various ancestors who did in fact fight in and during the Civil War on the Confederate side. It was a very, very complex decision for me, but whenever it finally come down to me actually meeting where the road met the rubber, it was not a complex, difficult decision for me because I understood that the ideology in behind Confederacy did engulf into a mainstream ideology towards trying to maintain slavery. Even though slavery had not already been legalized, even though Lincoln more than likely used slavery for an excuse of the Civil War about halfway into it, I understood that Confederacy is basically the same type of symbol that it would be to the to the Jewish population over in the Holy Land pertaining to the swastical Nazism sticker. With me being associated with the Confederate family in an indirect way, even though I was born up north, it was a bit complex at first towards me recognizing that this is and was a evil symbol. A symbol that needs to be put in the right proper place in historical value and not out here in the open so that it can agitate and aggravate people's emotions and people's feelings about the past. So once I come to that crossroads in recognizing that this symbol was nothing more or less than the symbol of a swastical sticker thinking that the white race was the predominant dominant race that could dominate all other races once I realized that this Confederate flag was in fact a evil demonic symbol, I turned about face real quick in identifying that. I have occasionally flown the Confederate flag in behalf of an anti-battle flag, anti-blood, anti-slavery anti-war. I have been known to fly the, Ameri the, the American Confederate flag in those regards. Now what that I will do in the future I don't know quite yet because there will be people that won't understand my concept for flying the Confederate flag unless they are very very aware and have been addressed of who I am and what I represent. In other words, if I pop up down in Memphis somewhere flying the Confederate flag, I'm liable to be, instead of being saluted, I'm liable to be shooted because of me flying a Confederate flag because people won't understand the reason why that I'm flying the Confederate flag being anti against what that flag represented. So because of it, I'm going to, I ain't going to use the word hide the Confederate flag away from society, but I will mask it to the point that it's not as obvious of me flying the Confederate flag because I never know who's going to drive by and being a witness to the Confederate flag to the point of being offended. 
So I'm going to end my presentation right here and there in regards to the Confederacy. And once more, I understand the feelings of others who are offended in all these statutes. Though we cannot do nothing about the past, what we can do is arrange the past to the point that the past is, yes, the past. And the past is never going to be the future again pertaining to legalizing any type of formal or informal slavery onto society, regardless whether it be here in America or it be somewhere else. So I'm going to end my conversation by saying that, and good luck to all of us once more again, and yes, shalom. God bless.